Sona, the State of the Nation address. Most people in South Africa want reliable power, of course, but is a national state of disaster as declared by the president in his speech the right tool to deal with the power crisis? Let's continue that discussion. We're joined now by Dr. Felix Dubé from the College of Law at UNISA. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Is it necessary? Thank you so much, Francis. I'm of the view that the government, in terms of the legislation in place, can actually declare this national state of disaster as they have done. I think in terms of the law, they are in the clear. That is because a disaster is defined in the Disaster Management Act, which is the law, as any occurrence, whether it's natural or it's human, that is either progressive or sudden, that causes sudden uh, death, injury or disease among the people, or that causes damage to property, infrastructure or the environment, or that causes a significant destruction of the life of the community, and the magnitude of which cannot be effectively dealt with by those who are in charge of it. I think we'll all agree that ESCOM has failed to resolve the electricity issue, and that its greater powers and resources are needed to deal with this. But as to whether they should, of course they can declare the state of disaster, but should they, I'm of the view that they should not have. That is because the government already has enough resources and the law at their disposal to do what they could have done without a state declaring a state of disaster. All right, let me pick up on, on your first point, uh, that legally government can do this. So, for instance, the DA is opposed to this. It wanted a, a ring fence state of disaster. This is going to go to court. So you think government will come out um, pretty clear on that, especially because we have precedents during COVID-19? I'm of the view that the, when this issue is being decided in court, the government is likely to prevail because, as I've just said, the law is on their side. What we're just not sure is whether they should have, did they really yeah. need to do it. But we'll get more clarity when the regulations have been promulgated because I've seen the declaration, but I'm yet to see the regulations themselves. And when we look at those regulations, for them to pass the legal test, they must show that they have been genuinely promulgated in order to assist and protect the public, that they have been promulgated to provide relief to the public, that they are meant to protect property, that they are meant to prevent or combat corruption, or that they are meant in another way to deal with the destructive or other effects of the disaster. I'm of the view that when those regulations come, they are probably going to be weighted and structured in such a way that they will probably show some proportionality to dealing with the destructive effect of this disaster that is um, ESCOM that we have right now. So I think legally they are in the clear. And also there's the added issue that even the judges themselves are human beings. I'm sure they really want to have electricity in their court. Yeah. So anything that might show that the issue will be resolved, they're probably going to, to give it a, a, a go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, th thank you for your response. I think many would agree with you, though, that maybe government could have done more within the bounds of sort of regular legislation. Uh, let's look at the red tape. That's one of the arguments cited for a declaration. We have a red tape cutter in the presidency. Uh, presumably, that could have been brought down for the last couple of years. Should the president fire that person? Yes. So, as, as I look at it right now, the government has enough law and resources at its disposal to do this. And since they have declared a state of disaster, they are going to unlock those ring fence resources that are only meant for disasters, and then they are going to channel them through to ESCOM and see if things would work. And then, of course, it's going to fast track the procurement process if anything has to be procured. But then, if you really look at it, I don't think it's really a one man's failure to say, uh, per se. Because this issue has been coming and coming, we sidestepped nuclear, we went on a very huge drive for renewables, and that has not helped us because in that process we have neglected where the really help comes from, and that help comes from ESCOM and Corp. So if you don't give ESCOM money, but you go overseas and take a lot of money for renewables, you're going to have a disaster in your hands because now they are closing the power stations, right? Mm -hmm. They are letting them to be closed within a decade, they don't have money for that. And we are not even so sure whether these renewables are going to help us. So I think as a nation, we sort of like took a wrong turn by stepping nuclear and also by going too hard into these renewables. That has failed in Europe. They haven't helped the Europeans. That's why the call is going there right now, if you look at that road to Richard's path. 
All right, so you're, you're opposed to renewables. I mean, surely there's some space for renewables given the way the world is going, but we have to protect what we've got, yes. But surely some scope for renewables. Yes, I, I'm not really opposed to renewables, but I'm of the view that if you caught a very small fish in the river and you are going to fry it for your dinner, if you throw it away without a bigger fish to fry, it means you cannot go to bed without dinner. That's how I would give that analogy. So what we have with the issue of renewables is that we have totally now neglected uh, our coal, we have neglected the ESCOM situation, and we have went into overdrive on renewables at a pace that I think is not affordable and without the necessary infrastructure for those renewables to help us. That's why you find ourselves in the dark right now. Yeah. I'm of the view that is the issue. And then also if you look at in Europe, they are buying the coal from South Africa. They are banning that coal. They are revamping their own coal power stations because they know that they can never run a country on wind and solar. And another issue is that Africa is too small, in my view, in the grand scheme of, of global politics and power to be able to influence anything when it comes to climate change. If there is anybody who can do that, it's the Americans and the Europeans. And if you look at what they're doing, they're actually going back into this coal that we are saying is too dead for the environment to burn. That's why we end up with no energy, but they have got the life owned in their own country. Mm. So we really need to balance all right, Doctor, thank you for your view. Uh, this, this opens up a whole new debate. Uh, we have a province with some of the worst air quality uh, right now. That's something I'm concerned about. Uh, but let's talk about, uh, you know, so there's something about supply chains, um, red tape. Th there was talk of bringing in old ESCOM workers. And because this is South Africa, many of those older workers are white. There was pushback for that. Do you believe that a state of disaster has any implications, uh, some people concerned about transformation, does it affect things like that? I don't think it should not ideally affect transformation, because look at the ESCOM leadership before the current administration. Who was leading ESCOM? I wouldn't want maybe to ask to indulge into the merits and the demerits of their removal, but they were black people and they were running ESCOM properly well. We didn't have load shedding during that time. So that tells me that we have enough black talent to actually get ESCOM and other SOEs on track to provide the services and goods that they have to provide. We don't even have to say uh, without uh, the old guys, then nothing would run. I think the country can run. We just have to put the right people there. All right. Thank you for your view. Uh, Dr. Felix Dubé, postdoctoral fellow, College of Law at UNISA.